everybody's pressed on time. The great thing about this stuff is you don't have to do an hour of core work every day. You don't have to go to the gym six days a week. When you look at changes in proprioception or what we call being able to steer your parts better and feel position, it's best to do that in small doses throughout the week rather than say, I'm going to put in 45 minutes in one day. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 170 of the Running For Real podcast. I am excited you are here. Thank you so much. We are closing in on 200. That is crazy to think about. But in some ways, it just it feels like so much more. I mean, I've just loved these conversations and I feel so honored and lucky to have had them and to be able to share them with you. When you tell me which ones really impact you, it really makes me feel good. It makes me feel like everything is worth it. And um, and thank you so much for, for your support within that. Now, last week we had Molly Huddle on the show. Now, as you know, Molly is one of America's kind of leading female runners right now. She has some high hopes for the Olympic trials next month. And, um, you know, she kind of updated us on how things were going. She was very vulnerable. Molly, you know, had always kind of been someone who um, maybe didn't say as much about how she was feeling. She did talk about how she is quite um, introverted and, and quiet, um, but she really let down her guard and kind of talked about some struggles and some things that she had gone through and how she kind of learned to forgive herself and move on from that. So I really enjoyed that episode and I hope you have been checking out her Keeping Track podcast because it really is worth listening to. Now today I have a special treat for you. I know you guys love to continually improve yourself as runners to find out what can help you keep running, um, staying healthy and staying strong. And today's topic, I actually didn't reach out to him. He reached out to me and said, look, this is a topic we need to cover. This is something that's really important. And it is something you guys bring up to me over and over again. So I'm so glad that he actually reached out to me and we are really lucky to have Jay DeSherry on the show today. He is definitely one of the most popular, the the best known physical therapists in the country. He's a board certified sports clinical specialist and he's just a wonderful person. Now you may remember him from a previous episode. He's also in my uh, podcast series in the Coming Back From Injury podcast series, which by the way, if any of you are injured, that series is my favorite one of all of them. There's six series total, one in pregnancy, in uh, nutrition, there's one for marathons, there's one for this coming back from injury, as I said, what are the other two? Oh, one for beginners. And there is another one, but I can't think of what it is. So you're seeing this is Tina running for real, for sure here. I uh, can't remember what the other one is, but the coming back from injury one is definitely the most helpful one. And if you are injured, I really, really recommend that. Um, I will have links in the show notes to that so you can go check it out. You can also just find it on my website in general. Jay is one of the uh, leading people in those six interviews uh, where you can learn about uh, how to come back from injury, how to get through those really tough parts when you are kind of set back. So I just wanted to tell you that I uh, am going to be pulling back from some things this year. The podcast is not one of them. However, I am going to be setting some things up so that when I do have my second child in May or June, I will be able to take a few months off. I am going to have maybe some guest hosts to take over some episodes and I'm going to get ahead with my episodes. So the podcast is not going to change. Be sure you have subscribed so you can continue to get the episodes as usual. And the other thing I'm also focusing on this year is email newsletter. I would love for you to come join. It is not spam. I do want your email. Yes, but that is just to stay in contact with you. It helps for letting you know that things that are coming up, reminding you of episodes that you may have missed. And every week I kind of give you like a thought something to like think about and and consider the way that you're doing things and the way that you're treating yourself. And it really is just like me writing a letter to a friend. I I really can't stress that enough. This is not a typical email newsletter. There's things I recommend, things that I like. Um, It's very honest, very real, very me, to be honest. So I'd love if you would sign up for that. That's something I'm really focusing on this year, making it as good as I possibly can. I get plenty of replies every week. So I know those of you who are subscribed do quite enjoy it. So you can find that at tinamuir.com forward slash subscriber. 
All right, so before we go meet Jay, we are just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Recoup Body Health and You Can, and we'll be right to the episode. Thank you to Recoup for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Your Podcast. Now, you've heard me talking about Recoup for the past few weeks, maybe, maybe a month, and I am absolutely loving it. I mean, I just wish that I would have had this when I was in college, when I was going through my elite career. There would have been so many times I would have used it. So let me tell you a bit more about it before I keep talking about just how much I would have gone back in time to have one of these. But they have a cryosphere and a cryo sleeve. Now, both of these are cold products. However, they are launching some uh, thermo sleeves, which are going to be warm products in March 2020. So these hot and cold sleeves and this hot and cold kind of ball that sits in a holder are used to kind of reduce inflammation. They're going to help with recovery. And I know that it's always going to be best for us to go to a physical therapist, to speak to someone, to really figure out what the problem is. And yes, that is always what I tell people. You know that more than anyone that I am not going to tell you which shoes you should wear, which which specific model. I mean, like this shoe is the best because I don't believe in that. I'm not going to tell you which injury you have because it doesn't work like that. We have to go see people. We have to figure out what the source is. Just because your knee hurts doesn't mean that it is necessarily the source of your knee. It could be coming from anywhere else. So I'm all about going to see experts. However, I do realize in many situations we are kind of stuck. You know, maybe you're a week out from your race and you've got some shin issues. Shin splints especially like to hit us hard when we are coming into that taper time. We're starting to panic. And that is where Recoup comes in. This is so handy having these sleeves that are going to give you an hour of um, cold compress that's going to be able to reduce that inflammation and help you. And then the the Sphere, which is a portable cold massage roller, which combines ice and massage. It stays cold for six hours. So you can have this relief on the go. You can use it multiple times. Um, it's basically an ice cup replacement, so it's mess free, easily cleanable, time saving. The sphere comes out of the handle so that you can use it on the bottom of your feet if you're struggling with plantar fasciitis or even, you know, in certain IT band situations. This is used by many professional athletes and it really has been something that I've been really impressed with what they've been able to make here. Um, As I said, the sleeve is also helpful. It's going to give you one hour of relief. And they also are coming up with ankle and shoulder ones uh, later in 2020. So I'm just really excited about what they are offering here. I think it could help so many people. And if you use code Tina Muir, you can get 15% off your order at recoupfitness.com. That's R-E-C-O-U-P fitness.com, recoupfitness.com. If you use code Tina Muir, you will get 15% off your order. Go do it. Jay, thank you for coming back on the Running For Your Podcast. I am excited to introduce you to some new people. We have a lot of new listeners since I first, or since I guess the last time I interviewed you. And uh, we have some people who will be excited to see your name and to hear you speak. So thank you for your time and for being here today. Thanks for having me here, Tina. It's always a great chat. Yeah, it it is always a good chat. And um, okay, so for those listening, I mentioned we do have a lot of new listeners how would you describe yourself? You know, you don't have to just say the titles that you have. Maybe you should include what you do. But how would you describe Jay DeSherry? I'm the guy you call when things don't work well. And I'm the guy you call when you want to push a needle to 11. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a PT and a gate researcher. And, uh, you know, my, my MO has been, how do you build a better mousetrap, right? So, um, how do you put people together better after they've been injured long time mm-hmm. for chronic issues and how do you optimize performance? So, um, I deal with mostly endurance athletes, but we do a bunch of work with, uh, US ski and snowboard folks as well. So yeah, it's all about uh, performance optimization and try and help people achieve their goals. Do you like the game mousetrap? You uh, I, <laughs> actually, my son and I play mousetrap quite a lot. Yes, I know. You just reminded me that game exists, and it's quite a fun one. So I figured that we it must probably, feature somewhere in your life. We probably play that at least once a month. Yes. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay, so that's that. That explains where that kind of came from. Um, and <laughs> thank you for explaining that in general. And so those listeners who don't know, so you may have heard me talking about um, the UVA Speed Clinic, which I visited not once, not twice, but three times during my elite running career, just try, kind of making tweaks. Well, Jay, was you were the founder, right? I know you were the, you were, are the director, but you were the founder of that clinic, correct? 
Yeah, correct. Yeah, and, that, that was a venture. Mm. Yeah, to try and you know take fancy lab equipment that we had for research, um, and uh, and 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 use it for for good. Right. Yeah. So to, to not just be able to say, look, here's a research study which showed an average result of a certain population, but to say, hey, you want to come in and you know do an end of one experiment, right? Find out where you sit. Um, and I think it was a, it was an interesting venture to kind of uh, help folks, you know measure things and see things that are tangible that you can't just look at in a video and you can't just look at online. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a, it's a really great, uh, venue. And I think I've learned a ton from that. I think my clients and patients learned a ton, but, um, I really try to take that, uh, the information I've learned and I, I teach internationally, uh, these days and try and, um, help clinicians, you know, based upon the lessons we've learned with, you know, fancy technology, what can you distill down to the masses and try and help folks help their own patients better? So it's been a big goal of mine to try and produce tools and information and content to try and help clinicians do a better job uh, with their own patients. Do you take the kind of results of various runners and use it in anything? Yeah, sure. We have case uh, case scenarios all the time. I mean, um, you know, again, we, we've done b both sides, right? I mean, that, that lab has produced a lot of research over the years. Uh, one of the fancy toys that, you know, people have in their gate labs these days is called an instrumented treadmill. It allows you to capture multi-stride data. And uh, we were the, the second facility in the world to have one of those. Um, I've been using the instrumented treadmills for, I mean, quite honestly, longer than anybody except the U.S. Army. So um, it's been it's been fun. To, you know, again, you, you learn a lot when you have high resolution equipment. So yeah. um, it's been a bit of fun adventure. But, yeah, we do a bunch of stuff. I mean, it, you know, research is great to show results and people like that. But uh, again, how does research translate to you? And I think it's been fun to show some case scenarios on you know where people come in and, you know, yeah, correlating those back to to training, right? So I always tell folks, look, if you're giving a certain type of training, expect a certain type of result. Mm -hmm. You know, don't expect things that you aren't training to improve. You have to be targeted in your approach. So, yeah. okay, great, thank you. And I think that means that technically, as I've been there three times, I'm part the result of your success. So I think <laughs> you should start adding my name to everything because having been there three times, I I obviously, you know, you can't you couldn't have done it without me. That's that's kind of the conclusion <laughs> i'm just kidding there you go <laughs> no i'm just kidding and you also um established the rep clinic which is in uh portland oregon uh, no bend oregon bend, yeah, oregon about, okay yeah. so anyone on the uh, west coast of the u.s you can also go uh check it out there and i know many of my listeners have been to the uva speed clinic and are huge fans of it uh have really learned a lot so thank you for that and that kind of sums up for people who you are and just how impressive you are so, you know, you reached out to me a few months ago and kind of said that, you know, um, it's important for runners to, you know, really start looking at their feet, um, this uh, connection point to the ground. Now, we kind of talked about doing this at the beginning of the year. Is, do, have, do you have any thoughts on why beginning of the year, why starting off a fresh year is a good time to start talking about this and start thinking about what we can do to, you know, strengthen and, and work on that connection point? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And it's like anytime somebody comes in our lab, I mean, the first question I ask everybody is, what are your goals? Right. And so uh, I'm a big fan of working backwards from those goals. And if you say, hey, I want to try and hit a PR on a 10K or my first marathon, or I want to knock 10, you know, hit Boston qualifier, or I'm trying to qualify for the trials, that discussion is, okay, well, let's work backwards from there and find out where those weak links are in your training from the physiological side and the biomechanical side. And um, I, I just find it interesting that. We've reached this point, you know, when we talked years ago, it was, it was funny, you know, a lot of people said, I just want to run, right? And I, my response is always, I just want you to run too, but mm -hmm. to run, you have to show up prepared and ready. And, uh, you know, we're at the point now, you know, from where you know, I first talked many years ago, where if you said runners should train core, you know, train their core, that's kind of common practice, right? And and I think even more is, you know, runners should train hip strength. And that's become more accepted, right? And mm -hmm. so um, you, you don't have just two body parts, right? I mean, you, you've got multiple body parts. And so, you know, one of the things I, I found over my career has been grossly neglected is uh, it's foot control, right? And so you, your foot is a connection point to the ground and uh, it works uh, it works in conjunction, not just, you know, in isolation, right? But it works in conjunction with the rest of your body, to help steer your body, right. To help maintain durability. And, uh, and it's even important in performance, you know, it's like, you know, you know people do push ups for chest strength, right. And they do glute bridges to get their, their hips to turn on. They do hamstring curls to get their hamstrings. And, you know, you can actually improve coordination, control, strength, and even performance from training your feet. Mm -hmm. 
So for someone listening who's thinking, okay, well, if this is so important, why are we only just kind of like hearing you talk about this as you being one of the leaders and and those of my listeners who don't know Jay, once you start following him and what he's doing, he really is one of the the people that kind of influences everyone else. So why, why is it, if it's so important, you know, um, why are we only just talking about it now? Is it a case of like, okay, your core is the most important thing, then you figure out your hips and then you can get to your feet? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for that, by the way. It's very nice of you to say those things. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. um, I, I think there are a few things going on here. Number one, I always go back to when I was in PT school, ALSU, in, um, in 2000, 2001, uh, you know, what we were told on foot and ankle biomechanics was kind of very rudimentary content, right? And so, um, you know, a lot of the quote, biomechanics research that we learned is was actually very marketing driven by the shoe companies, right? And the, the reality was a lot of the shoe companies, you know, have they didn't even have fancy, you know, equipment in their own labs. And so if they had a lab, and so it, it was kind of this big disparity between what you, what we'd find out later to be true, what you hope to be true, right? Such things as, oh, well, you stick your foot in a shoe and it takes care of everything. Um, and, you know, over the course of you know years, we've gotten better equipment and better understanding and, and, and more importantly, how to make actionable decisions from, you know, lab-based equipment. Uh, and so we, we've seen things play out in terms of uh, how the foot moves, how the foot behaves. And, you know, the, the old the old you know stories we had, you know, 15, 20 years ago were, you know, are you a pronator? Are you a supinator? Right. And, and we know now that th- those are not categories. Right? Mm-hmm. It's not like you're you know, a certain race or ethnicity. Uh, mm-hmm. Pronation and supination are, are things that need to happen. Wait, I just want you to say that one more time because people yeah. <laughs> need to hear this. Listen up closely. Say that again. Yeah. Everyone needs to pronate and supinate, period. If somebody tells you you are a supinator or pronator, just walk away from them. They have... (laughs) They probably don't understand what they're talking about. Um, so, so feet need to move, right? I mean, they're dynamic structures. It, it's not like you know an arch on a bridge that just stays static. It, it needs to move. Mm-hmm. In fact, you want your foot to move. If it doesn't move, we have problems, right? So, if it moves too much, we have a control issue. So, it's like it, it, you want your foot to move under control in a certain amount, a certain way, um, and that amount is variable, right? I mean, some people say, "Oh, I have low arches. I can't run." I mean, I. I always go back to one of the shoe studies we did years ago, and I've told the story many times, but still, it's like it was just one of those aha moments I've had in my career where, uh, you know, one of our kids came in and one of our runners at EVA, and he came in for a shoe study and he took his shoe off, and his navicular, which is a bone in your foot, which is kind of the top of your arch, was literally on the floor. Okay. He had one of the lowest arches that I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And, and he's the kind of guy you look at and you're like, excuse me, you should go buy a bike and you should stop running. Like you're not going to hold up. Like, you know, 30 years ago, he wouldn't have been in the, in the military. Uh, and the guy ran a 1440 something 5k, right? Like, and he never had one injury. So, you know, it's okay to have a lower arch as long as you have control of it. Mm-hmm. It's okay to have a higher arch as long as you have control of it, right? And so I think a lot of the things get back to what you say. How is this discussion relevant now? Why is it shifted? I think that, you know, we're learning different things. I think we have tools to, to measure and look at things now. We have outcomes research to find out, you know, look, if you take somebody who comes in through foot control, you teach them to control their very low arch, they start to run really well, right? They start to be able to sustain higher training load. They start to be able to perform well. So I think a lot of it's been, you know, you had fan, we had no equipment and we had fancy equipment just to give you binary data and couldn't make decisions off it. Now we're at the point where we can actually do some actionable things. And so um, one of the things I've done in my career is try to, um, you know, I, I made an entire approach to what I call rebuild the foot, right? So find out what aspects of the foot are moving appropriately for each person not just for an average, right? What aspects of the foot uh, need to be improved in terms of control for each person, right? I think it's one of the key things is individualizing, you know, your approach to each person's feet. Uh, and, and and that's taken a long time, right? And, and to, to be able to try and take, you know, make research actionable. I always tell folks, read a research study. It's, it's nice to read that, but you have to make it something that applies to each person. And so um, I think that's where right now we're finally at the point where we can start get things to work, you know, together and, and, and feet don't work in isolation, like we said. I mean, you, you mentioned, do you, do you start with the, the core of the hips? I mean, so again, let's talk about, you know, everybody's, you know, 
has a race picture. Somebody's got to come across the finish line where your knee's kind of diving into the inside and you think, Oh, you're, I have to work on better hip control to steer my knee straight. And you very may well, right. That might happen. Uh, you also might have to look at your core control because that plays a big role, but you also have to look at your foot control, right? Because, um, that entire leg twists, right. And twists in and out. And, uh, and you've got multiple aspects of your body that you need to work in coordinated fashion to control your position. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I want to dive into this a lot deeper um, in a minute with um, with regards to those three areas and how they kind of play in together. But firstly, you know, you mentioned about shoes and how they kind of the, the shoe companies kind of came along and said, you know, we we keep we keep making a better shoe for you. That's all you need. And we know that there's a certain shoe company who is definitely <laughs> throwing all their eggs in a basket to, to put their money on the one big shoe or a few big shoes. So for someone listening who's thinking, can I, can I not just like buy a shoe that's made for my foot? Like this person in a running shoe store said, this one is the right shoe for me. Won't that help my foot strength by just getting the right shoe? Yeah. So, uh, I would say this, there's a few things. Let's, let's tackle a few. Yeah, you can ask kind of an open-ended question. Um, mm-hmm. so one is, can a shoe actually strengthen your foot? There have been uh, quite a few efforts when when we had the barefoot craze, right? There's been quite a few efforts by a bunch of companies, uh, companies, uh, universities to quantify, um, can you actually improve foot strength? Um, And I would say those results are mixed. I mean, Bibram even got sued for making this claim years ago. Um, You have to be careful. We did do a study at University of Virginia. Uh, We actually looked at um, cross-sectional area. So if you take a muscle and you um, basically slice it down the middle, uh, more area, right, is indicative of more strength. And we actually did see, it was a, a small palate study, but we did see actually an improvement in, uh, in the cross-sectional area of the foot muscles with uh, folks who ran a minimal shoe. Um, so I think that there's some validity to the point where, you know, if you if you load tissue, it tends to respond by getting more more strength, right? So uh, I think there is there is a possible role for that. Let's go back to how you train, though. So if you're trying to race, right, you don't just run easy every single run. You have to put certain quality interval work and you put strength work in, you put hill sessions in. And like, you know, I always tell people, if your goal is to strengthen your foot, then just strengthen your foot, right? I mean, don't wait and, and, and you know, maybe get a tiny gain or a negligible gain from a shoe. So let's, let's, let's start with that for later. But um, I think that uh, when you look at um, what shoes have done, I mean, I always tell runners, you know, you're, you're, you have a, a certain considerable body mass, right? You're probably between, if you're an adult, you're between, let's say, low 90s to, you know, 300 pounds. You know, do you really expect the shoe, which weighs 8 ounces to 13 ounces, to control your entire body weight when you run? That's a myth, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have a lot of load going through your body. You have a lot of load um, that, that you're having to steer, control, and stabilize. And so, shoes are filters, right? I think that's the best way I, I explain them. A shoe is a filter that changes the way your foot adapts to the ground, and it changes the, the what you perceive as far as how your foot contacts the ground. And so um, matching a shoe is not about matching to your foot type or matching to your arch height, right? Matching a shoe is finding a shoe that um, is, quote, stiff enough and, you know, fits the, just, you know, literally can grow with the shape of your feet that allows you to work at your best. Thank you to Generation You Can for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast and for supporting me for all these years. Um, I have been using Generation You Can for years now and I recently actually had a question during a live show about um, gels and, uh, you know, for me, I just can't stomach the idea of them anymore. I, I just, I love my You Can. It works. It gives you that steady energy that just means there's no crashes. Um, I love that Joe used it when I was guiding him and he kept saying, you know, how good he felt. And um, he loved that he was using the UCAN to help him get there. He also had a bar before his race. Um, I think maybe two bars actually. And uh, it was just really nice to see someone else kind of getting the benefits from it. And I hear many of you telling me about how much you appreciate you can, how much you use it. And they do have these sample packs that you, if you are unsure whether you want to go for a big tub, you can try it out. Um, However, the big deal that I am able to give you is 25% off your order. Even if you've ordered with Generation You Can before by using code TINAMUA25, if you want to give it a try, 25% off your order. That's pretty impressive. You know, I love the cranberry raspberry tub, the powder that I can put a scoop into my uh, drink. 
before a run or during a run, if I was going to go on a long enough run, which not really right now, but if I was, that is what I would be using. However, for me, the bars are where it's at right now. I absolutely love the bars, have a bar every single day. Peanut butter and chocolate is my favorite flavor, but there are plenty of flavors for you to choose from and they really are enjoyable to eat. They are perfect to eat at any point. Um, You can eat them after your runs when you kind of in a bit of a rush have to get off somewhere. Or I like to sometimes even eat them literally as I'm getting ready to walk out the door on a run because the amazing thing about Yukan is it does not upset your stomach. It is really uh, the first product I've ever come across that has never, I've never had a problem with my stomach. So you can get 25% off your order, as I mentioned, by going to generationyoucan.com and using code TINAMUA25. And I cannot wait to hear more of you telling me just how much it's changed your running. A shoe is a filter that changes the way your foot adapts to the ground, and it changes the, the what you perceive as far as how your foot contacts the ground. And so um, matching a shoe is not about matching to your foot type or matching to your arch height, right? Matching a shoe is finding a shoe that um, is, quote, stiff enough and you know, fits the, just, you know, literally congruent with the shape of your feet that allows you to work at your best. Right. And and I think that when you have a shoe that works with you, it doesn't work with you. Everybody said shoes like, and don't like I mean, myself included. Um, it's not a shoe that's quote, stopping your foot or controlling your shoe with your foot. Um, I think that one of the things I try, I mean, I, I teach footwear education for companies and, and retailers and clinicians across the country. And, and I, I try and tell folks all the time, look, our existing terminology we've had for years has been, you know, stop motion, control motion, you know, anchor your foot. And that needs to change, right? We need to change that discussion from adapt, conform, and move with the athlete, right? Uh, because we have to have footwear that allows our foot to move appropriately under control. And and so you want to have things that work with you. And, and I think that a lot of runners have been, you know, 20 years ago, they bought an Asics Gel 3000, right? And they're still in the same shoe 20 years later. You know, I'm not saying you have to go barefoot. I don't think that should be a goal. Uh, you know, that's not the award, right? I think that, you know, try different footwear options out there. Most people haven't tried anything besides that one shoe they've been in. And they're in what I call a codependent relationship. You know, you've been like dependent on this one shoe for a long time because you've done nothing to actually make your body better. And so you're kind of getting by you know, with this shoe, which is kind of just, you know, letting you kind of tread water. But how do you know, like for someone going in a shoe store, maybe the sh- store lets them run on a treadmill for a few minutes or, you know, run run down the road and back. But how how do you know within that short period whether, you know, you said try different shoes. How How does someone know if they're looking at the whole rack of, you know, up to 50 shoes, which one to get? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say, um, whether you know it or not, a lot of the shoes that you're, that you see right now on the wall are considerably different than they were five years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. So the one thing the barefoot movement did was it, it, it basically got a lot of technology, uh, not to say technology is to say a lot of parts stripped out of shoes. So let's say you've been running in a Brooks adrenaline for the past, you know, 20 years, right? The Brooks adrenaline today is nothing like the Brooks adrenaline was back then. And even though you're still emotionally connected to the idea that you're running a Brooks adrenaline, the Brooks adrenaline still marketed as a stability shoe. It doesn't have a medial post anymore, right? So, um, even though you say you're a fan of the Brooks adrenaline, you're in a shoe, which behaves nothing like it did back in, you know, 2001, right? So I think that get out of the, the mind, mindset that you have to be in this one shoe. Um, I think that if you go into a retailer, you know, you want to talk to your retailer and say, Hey, look, here's what I've been in and had success in. Here's why I have not had success in. Right. Um, I'd like to try some things that are similar to what I've had success in. And why don't you pull some zebras out that I haven't tried before? I think that, you know, trying some new options and you'll know, I mean, you put things on like, Oh, this feels good. This doesn't. But you know, I always tell folks, I have a mountain bike and a road bike and I have two very different purposes, right? Golfers have different clubs for different things. You shouldn't have one shoe. Um, the, you know, there, there's some some trends in the research that show clearly uh, that you run slightly differently, right? And you have slightly different reactions as far as how we stabilize your body in different footwear. And you want to train yourself comprehensively. So it's not just have a shoe to run in in a racing flat. I mean, you, you should have shoes that are different for you know different days of the week just to kind of get your body exposed to slightly different stimulus. Uh, and that, that's a protective effect as far as uh, for, durability and it's also smart for um again just training different actions in your feet so okay thank you and we're going to go uh, deeper into kind of more about the foot in just a minute but just to finish up with shoes 
um, as an ultra athlete, I have moved across to ultra and I can't imagine going back because of the wide toe boxes. Um, for me, I just, now I've got used to it. Um, I just can't imagine going back into shoe shaped shoes, but, uh, what is the research, which is what they call it. Uh, yeah. what is the research, um, found or what have you found about, do we need to separate our toes out? Is there any harm in kind of um, our toes being in, you know, the tight constricting of the toe shoes? Yeah, this is a great question, Tina. Um, and so this goes back to the idea, you know, the, the slogan, the customer is always right. Yeah. Um, sometimes the customer is not always right. <laughs> and the reason why is because you haven't tried things, right? So we live in this world where people think that a shoe needs to fit like a tight glove. And the tighter it is, the more compact it is, the more it works with you. That has never been shown to be true ever in the history of all biomechanics research. Okay. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two, and I have a picture in, in my book, Running Rewired and Anatomy for Runners as well. Um, you know, when you take a foot and you basically have it to stand, right, uh, your foot splays naturally. And that's just with, you know, half your weight on the foot, right? So when you stand up, you have half your weight in each foot. And when you run, you've got, you know, several times more than just single leg stance, right? You've got like two and a half, three times body weight. So there's even more splay. And I mean, it's pretty simple. Like if you look at your hand, put your fingers close to gate and look at your hand, open your fingers, fan them outward, and you'll see there's a lot more space, a lot more width, right? A wider hand is more stable than a narrow hand. It's pretty simple, right? So um, when you allow your foot to splay out, you actually let your foot structure do a better job. Um, and, and, you know, there's been some things that happen in a, in a micro aspect and a macro aspect, right? So when you look at, uh, I've, I've had the privilege of working with a bunch of uh, East African runners who are raised predominantly barefoot and run barefoot just for, not just for sport, for transportation, right? That's their, that's just what they do. And their feet structure is quite different than folks in shot society. They have very stiff, wide feet. Okay. Uh, because again, they use their structure. And again, when you load your body, it responds by becoming stronger, more dense, more stable, et cetera. And the bone structure is different. Everything's different. Um, and so, you know, if you look at what happens with kids, you know, a lot of times we, you know, you want your kid to have those quote cute shoes and you put them in these like ridiculously soft marshmallowy things that you're, you know, 15 pound kid can't bend, right? It's why you, when you look at your kids and they walk like they're on, you know, stilts it's because they can't bend the shoe, you know? Um, and I think from early on, we're putting kids in way too stiff shoes and too soft, squishy shoes. And then that perseverates just down the line. And so, you know, I, I've said for years, runners should be in as little shoe as possible to maintain success. And I mean, I am, I'm very adamant with my own kids that they're in wide toe boxes, very floppy, soft shoes, um, because they don't weigh anything. Right. And they have to be able to bend the shoe and I want to train proper foot control and I want to keep their, their foot where it is. Right. If you look at the, if you're listening to the show, if you take your shoe off, there's a great chance to look down at your bare foot. The widest part of your foot is the ball of your foot, not your toes. Right. And when you look at unshy societies, the widest part of their foot is their toe splay, not their metatarsal head. So there's a bunch of changes that happen here. And so my, my point about that you, you're not being right, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not listening to you, but most folks have been in too narrow of a shoe box, of a toe box on their shoes, and they've never tried wider uh, toe boxes. Um, and and I'll give you an example. I'm not going to name the company, but years ago, one company tried to make a water toe box variant of a very successful selling shoe. And the overwhelming feedback was it feels sloppy. It's too roomy up front. It doesn't feel as tight as the shoes I'm used to. And that shoe was the next season came back with, with an hour toe box. And I know it feels different. Difference, not bad difference. Good. And so, um, let yourself try a wider shoe, right? And, and, um, I, that's, a hundred percent should be across the board. Uh, you know, toe box widths need to come, need, need to expand. They really do. Okay. Thank you. And I will put, um, after this episode for you guys listening, if you do want to try, I'll put some of my favorite ultra shoes out there. But, um, one thing I do want to add is also you have to get used to mentally. I know for a lot of people and myself included, when I first put those shoes on with wide toe boxes, I looked down and I was like, God, these look like clown shoes. Like they don't look, they look weird. I, you know, everyone's going to be laughing at me, but A, no one notices and B, you'll be surprised how quickly you get used to it. But you've just kind of your whole life, you've seen these certain uh, foot shapes. And it's funny you mentioned about kids because 
I had not an argument with my mum, but when I was home last, she kept trying to buy my daughter shoes. And I'd go into a, a shoe store, a ch- children's shoe store, and there would be maybe two shoes that I was like, okay, she can have those or those. And my mum would be like, look at these. They're so cute. Look at these. And I'd be like, nope too wide nope too (laughs) stiff and she was getting so annoyed because she was like these are so cute and I was like nope these are the two she can have these otherwise you know we're getting them somewhere else like I know some companies that you know do have the right shoes and for those that think ultra are coming out with kids shoes little sneak peek there but yeah I just my mum just was like I don't understand like these ones are so cute and I was like I'm not squeezing her foot into a shoe already so um I get you with that one and uh, let, let, let me just say this. Yeah. So I, I'll just, I'll just, this gets into some stuff. I'd say like some of this is some research stuff we've done. Some it's what I've seen planet over the years. Mm-hmm. If you say, Hey, based on everything you've seen in your career, what's your take home statement for parents? Um, I would just say this. Um, I would beg you as a parent, to consider putting your kids in way less stiff, way less structured shoes. If you look at what happens in you know developmental years, if you if your kids are going to become a running based athlete, not just a cross country runner, but a running based athlete, what if you could look at your you know your one or two year old, three year old kid right now and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you a better foot in ten years. So when you're ready to point to actually start training, I'm giving you the gift of better foot control. Like. Literally, you by putting your kid in those stiff shoes, you are preventing their feet from working normally. And, and I just think this comes down to education as far as we want to help our kids succeed, right? Like I look at like almost like a hidden advantage, you know? I mean, my, my, some of my daughter's friends are like, why can't I get these? I'm like, no, because they're bad for your feet. Okay, cool. Like, you know, just I think there, there's, some, there's some validity in that that I think needs to get out there. And, and I hope that you consider that with your own stuff for your shopping for your kids. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So moving on, um, just going backwards a a few steps. So, you know, we've mentioned about um, feet being the connection point to the ground, feet being so important. You know, you mentioned about the runner crossing with their knees kind of caving in. But for someone listening, saying, how could my foot be causing my hip, knee, back, you know, insert here, pain when it's my foot? It's all the way, it's a long way away from my hip. So how could that possibly be doing any damage like I get that my landing you know maybe I need to change my landing or something you know about my foot but how is it it can't possibly be the reason for my hip pain yeah so let's think about a little baby biomechanics class right so when you run you've got to deal with vertical forces forces up and down you have to deal with braking acceleration forces and forces side to side. And you also have rotational forces that move through your body, right? And so um, one of the ways you can think about this is you want to run efficiently, which means you want to push down on the ground to blast your body up and forward for each stride. And you also have to steer your parts, right? Mm-hmm. So um, when you look at yourself moving forward, you want to make sure you can keep your core, right? Upper body, core, pelvis, hip, knee, foot, everything, right? Has to be in dynamic alignment. And by saying dynamic alignment, which is a fancy way to say it's staying controlled while moving, because again, things need to actually spin in and spin out. And when you run, think about it, when one leg comes forward, you counter rotate your upper body, right? So your left leg comes forward, your right shoulder comes forward. When your right foot comes forward, your left shoulder comes forward, right? So you counter as counter rotation, um, the biomechanics nerd community like myself call this, uh, the free moment. It's a line that you spin around. The best way I explain this is if you've ever seen a pellet drum, it's like a, a little wooden drum on a stick and it has those two beads hanging down. You take your hands and move them back and forth and the beads kind of go dink to dink to dink to dink mm-hmm. on each side. And so imagine if you are walking forward with that pellet drum. So as you're moving forward, you're kind of just twisting that pellet drum, right? And so that's a great analogy for kind of reciprocal energy exchange between one side of the body and the other. And so um, you have to have that line, right? We measure this in our labs all the time, but that line moves through everything. And so when you contact the ground, what happens is everyone, and I don't want to get into a debate here on, you know, forefoot, rear foot, midfoot, whatever, it doesn't matter. Every single person, when they walk and run, contacts on the outside of the foot and your foot needs to contact the outside and it needs to adapt down to the ground. Um, I'm a big fan of using the word adapt and not the word pronate because of what we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. People think they have a, a, a you know diagnosis. Okay, so um, I, the analogy all the time is if the lunar lander comes down on Mars, right? It doesn't just basically come down clunk perfectly straight. 
it hits and has to, those legs have to be soft to allow the little lander to adapt down to the planet, right? And so you have to have a foot which adapts down to our planet, right? And so that requires some dissociation or motion in the outside of the foot and the heel, right, to allow the big toe to come down to the ground. And when that happens, the shin screws with the foot and the knee screws with the foot and the hip screws with the foot, right? And the pelvis moves with the foot. And then we experience a time of peak adaptation where the, where the arch is most collapsed, right? Because again, arches need to move when, when you walk and run. Um, and just, uh, well, a little side note, we can come back to you later on that. But, um, and then we achieve a peak, right? And then we have a period where the foot re locks or become supinated, right? And so to push off on a firm foot. And guess what happens with that? As the foot moves out, the shin and the knee and the hip and the spine and the pelvis and all rotate with it, right? Mm-hmm. So um, that whole, it needs to work as a system is the best way to think about this. Um, so when you look at what happens, um, you know, parts need to move. They need to move under control. And I guess this is a good time to put it in. You mentioned earlier, you know, what things have, have, has, uh, have kind of shaped this discussion. Um, we published an article back in 2009, which looked at um, different uh, foot mobility in different groups, right? So if you have runners come in and say, okay, you have a low arch uh, and you have a midi march and you have a high arch, you know, how do your feet move? And so when you just have people sit and stand, you can you know, class five feet pretty well. But when we actually have people walk and run, the difference between the stiffest feet and the the, the most mobile feet was a whopping 1.7 millimeters mm-hmm. as far as we measure this thing called a drop or arch collapse. So if you want to, you know, put your fingers together and put a 1.7 millimeters apart and obsess about that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I would <laughs> take a deep breath. Okay. Um, so you know, don't get obsessed with the foot type that you have. Okay. Get obsessed with improving the control of the foot that you've got. Uh, And I think that's the message I think to get across today to folks is, um, you know, your shoe's not going to control your foot. You have to control your foot. Shoes are filters. They can modify how our foot behaves for sure. But when you look at that whole, you know, again, that twisting mechanism that happens from the, from the foot up, um, it makes a difference. And from the hip down, it makes a difference. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then give us some other benefits of foot training just before we kind of explain how and where to go from here. What are some other benefits? Yeah. yeah so your, your foot has to do sort of three things, right? It has to adapt down the ground. We talked about that. Um, and when it adapts down the ground, the whole goal is to get your big toe down to the ground for support and stability. And so that's first benefit is, is stability, right? So when you talk about is a shoe stable, shoes aren't stable. They're inanimate objects. A cup on your table is not stable, mm-hmm. right? You, you have a brain, you're an actively controlled neuromuscular system, and you have to train your body to move correctly. So they're important for durability to build long-term health, right? So not just of the foot, of the whole system. Um, and then uh, there's some great research that's come out lately to show that, guess what? You can run faster, cut harder, jump higher with a stronger foot. So um, it's like, you know, people always say, oh, well, really? Uh, you know, they're surprised. Like, wow, my foot really matters? I'm like, well, your hips matter. Your quads matter, your hamstrings matter. Why don't muscles in your feet matter, right? It's just another part of your body that deserves attention. So, um, you know, I always tell folks, look, are you serious about this? Like, do you really want to get better? You know, if you're if you're investing time listening to you know Tina and I talk about this podcast, I'm hopefully that you're going to go back and say, okay, what did that you, know, you mentioned earlier? What's that long term goal I had this year, right? So let's peel those layers back. What am I doing to prepare for that long term goal? I hope if you listen to this show, you're going to say, what am I doing to train? Yes, my core. Yes, my hips. Yes, my feet, right? Uh, To prepare my body to be able to sustain training and to be able to move better. And what if someone listening is thinking, okay, I get it, but uh, that's just another thing to add to my list. You know, first I was just running. Then I had to start strengthening my core. Now I have to start strengthening my hips. Then I had to start strengthening my feet. And I'm supposed to be foam rolling. And I'm supposed to be you know, um, stretching and I'm supposed to be doing mobility. Like, is this just another thing I have to add to my list and and how much time is this going to take for me? Yeah. Great question. So is it another thing you have to add? I'm going to say it's another thing you should add. Uh, somebody joked, what's the title of my next book, which I haven't written another book. I haven't written another book yet, but I would just joke, but like, this is kind of true. I call it running injuries. It's your own damn fault. (laughs) <laughs> and, and the reason why I'd say that is because, again, you're just throwing a bunch of load on top of problematic control, right? So take some responsibility for yourself mm-hmm. and, and figure out a plan. Now, you just mentioned reality. Everybody's pressed on time. I get it 100%. 
the great thing about this stuff is if you, let's put these into categories, right? You don't have to do an hour of core work every day. You don't have to do an hour of hip work every day. You don't have to go to the gym six days a week. Okay. When you look at changes in proprioception or what we call you know, be able to steer your parts better and feel position, whether it's the foot or anything else, it's best to do that in small doses throughout the week rather than say, I'm going to put in 45 minutes at one day. Right. So when I have folks talking about, you know, foot specific work, I say, look, find five to 10 minutes, a few days a week. Right. If you can't do that, guess what? Think about it a different way. That's your dynamic warm up, right? Before you go out for your run, I mean, if you if you spend time stretching for five minutes, do me a favor. Don't do that. Do some foot control things. Do some hip activation work, right? That just kind of sets the tone for the rest of the day. So you can incorporate it various different ways. But seriously, when you look at proprioceptive work, you don't need to do a lot of volume. And in fact, a lot of the stuff we see with proprioception deals with training our brain awareness, right? And so when you do too much work, you actually get fatigued. And when you lose that ability to sense what you're doing, you tend to move poorly. So I rather people challenge themselves. Um, I always tell folks, you're not looking to just, you know, make a hard exercise to post on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You're looking to actually get better, right? Mm -hmm. So the way you get better is to find some, you know, exercise tool, whatever it is you're going to do, that's going to help you win, right? It takes thousands of repetitions to train correct movement, right? To learn how to move better. We literally learn through movement. So that's why people say, oh, it's just more exercises. It's not more exercises. We're trying to train your brain to work better. Um, the reason I call my last book Run and Rewired is because I'm getting at the point where, you know, yes, strength is important, but one of the big things is you're trying to have automatic control of our body, right? So, uh, let me get too cognitive here, but let's just think about this. If you, if you walk or run and I told you to, you know, hop on your right foot every time, right? That's not normal, but you could make a decision in your brain to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can modify the way you move by thought, but when you look at how we walk, run, ride a bike, swim, etc., all these repetitive movement tasks happen in our brainstem, this thing called the central pattern generators. There's your fancy word for the day. Um, and so, Everybody walks slightly different, runs slightly different, swims, bikes, et cetera, slightly different based upon how that imagine a little program in your brainstem. And so when you say, when somebody says, oh, your hips are shut off or your foot's not firing or something like that, those muscles are there. They're not weak. Okay. Uh, but what happens is that natural mechanism where we move isn't utilizing our body properly, right? So it's not the fact the muscles aren't there, but that's not kind of synced into your normal program. And so when you look at how to modify those, it takes a lot of repetition of things that you're doing correctly, right? Under control. So don't make us, don't do things that are too hard. Do things that are doable. Do a lot of volume of them. How's that? How are you going to split that up? A few minutes a day, a day right? Just split it up that, that way. You know, this can be stuff when you're making coffee in the morning. If you're, you know, jumping up for your run, if you're, you know, listen to this podcast right now. I mean, just th these aren't things that take a ton of time. You just want to be consistent with them. Thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this episode of the Running For A Podcast and for supporting me for all these years. You have heard me talking about Body Health Perfect Amino for probably five years now, and there is a reason for that. I truly believe in this company and Perfect Amino and what it does. And I have to say, recently when I was at the California International Marathon, there was a ton of you that came up to me and said how you had heard me talking about it all these years, probably pestering you. But you've decided to give it a go and you were kind of shocked by the difference it made and how much better you feel. There were so many people that said that to me in person and it was just so nice to hear in addition to those of you who reach out to me. So if you are listening to this and you've been hearing me talking about it and you're wondering, I don't get it. Like, how does it work? Like, what does what does it do that's so special? Well, I just want to kind of explain again, as it's been a little while since I've said this. So we all know that we need um, amino acids. They help with recovery. They kind of build our body up. You know, we're breaking them down with training and amino acids are what you need to to build it back up. But what we don't often talk about or hear about is that only up to 48% of the food that we take in in these protein sources is actually able to be uh, used, utilized, I should say. Uh, the rest of it is converted to waste. So that's things like eggs are 48% of them are utilized, meat, poultry, and fish, 32%. 2% of it our body can utilize and turn into these amino acids. However, body health, 99% of it is utilized by the body. Only 1% has to be kind of removed and uh, 
taken out as waste, which means that your body can get what it needs. It can help you to recover. I've really seen the difference in myself. As I've said so many times, as an elite runner, I trained using this. I really noticed the difference when I missed it for a few days. And now I take it just to kind of help my body recover with all the other things I'm throwing at it. So it really helps with that too. It contains the eight essential amino acids the body needs to support and maintain its muscular, skeletal, and sigmatic. That's such a hard word to say and hormonal systems. So you've heard me talking about it. So go give it a try. Go to tinamuir.com forward slash aminos. That's A-M-I-N-O-S, tinamuir.com forward slash aminos and go into 2020 right. Come on, let's set you up so that you can succeed and you can recover because if you are healthy and staying healthy, then you are going to have the races that you want. You can you can give yourself the best chance to su- succeed. So go get some, tinamuir.com forward slash aminos. Everybody walks slightly different, runs slightly different, swims, bikes, et cetera, slightly different based upon how that imagine a little program in your brainstem. And so when you say, when somebody says, oh, your hips are shut off or your foot's not firing or something like that, those muscles are there. They're not weak. Okay. But what happens is that natural mechanism where we move isn't utilizing our body properly. Right. So it's not the fact the muscles aren't there, but that's not kind of synced into your normal program. And so when you look at how to modify those, it takes a lot of repetition of things that you're doing correctly, right? Under control. So mm-hmm. don't make us, don't do things that are too hard. Do things that are doable. Do a lot of volume of them. How's that, how are you going to split that up? A few minutes a day, a day right? Just split it up th- that way. You know, this could be stuff when you're, you know, making coffee in the morning. If you're, you know, jumping out for your run, if you're, you know, listening to this podcast right now. I mean, just th- these aren't things that take a ton of time. You just want to be consistent with them. So in your normal plan for the week, think about, okay, I'm putting in, you know, X amount of time on this. If you think about it, if you're putting in maybe, you know, 20 minutes a week, right? So split up throughout the week, that's five to 10 minutes a day, whatever, two to four days a week. Like that's, that's a simple ask. Um, and, and then I would always tell folks, you know, the vast majority of athletes out there are better skipping out on extra half a mile of a run or maybe even dropping one day a week entirely to, again, prepare your body for the goals that you've got, right? So it doesn't mean you have to have five personal trainers and, you know, get two nutrition coaches and everything else. Keep it simple, but keep it actionable and keep, and be consistent. You know, I always tell people, you got to be consistent. The the exercises you did three days, you know, in a row, and then you don't do anything for two weeks, that's not going to work. I mean, you wouldn't run that way, right? You wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to go run today, tomorrow, the next day, and then not run for two weeks and expect to PR. That's just a bad strategy. So I guess with that, uh, it also comes down to, you know, pick a pick something that's realistic to you. Don't say I'm going to do what Jay says every day. And then, yeah, like you said, do it for three days and then be like, oh, no, no, mind. But say straight off, you know, I'm going to do this two days a week. That's five to 10 minutes. And, and then that's what I'm going to stick to, you know, set an alarm if you need to. Um, but yeah, like, like Jay says, if this really is, if you do have these big goals, these really important things, and especially if you keep having little things come up, um, you know, what, what do you have to lose really? And we're going to go into kind of what that is. Cause people are probably screaming at me right now. Like, okay, tell me what I need to do. But first, just one more thing. Um, <laughs> you mentioned about barefoot does, you know, a few minutes of barefoot running a day help like after you run or, you know, building up, like is barefoot running going to be good for you? Um, for that foot strength, can you kind of bypass what you're talking about by, getting to the point where you can do a bit, a little bit of barefoot running? Yeah. So, um, I, again, I think I'd say in my experience, again, looking at research, looking at N of one studies, folks come in looking at outcomes. I would say if you're somebody who's younger, right. Mm. Um, I'd as say that what? you, as in like, you know, youth, like, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, up okay. until middle school, uh, and, and you've, you've been in less stuff. Uh, you tend to be pretty in tune with your feet, right? You tend to have very good foot control because what happens is we just lose as we age. Um, if you've got somebody who's very athletic, and I, I don't mean that in a, to say some people aren't athletic, but if you have somebody who's very in tune with their movement, I think that um, putting in a few minutes of barefoot running per week uh, is probably enough to help build some awareness. Um, but the vast majority of folks, you know, I say take off your shoe and stand on one foot and they're drunk, right? I mean, they literally have no clue how to stand on their foot. They're wobbling off the outside. Their pelvis is shifting and leaning one direction. You know, just telling that person to run barefoot a few days a week, again, like what's the most specific way to get better? 
spend some, some time working on your feet. So I think it's a good adjunct. I think it tends to lead some awareness with folks, which is great. Uh, and I, I, I am a fan of putting that in at some strides. I love doing strides barefoot. Um, again, most people say they don't run barefoot because of, you know, the road or the you know, surface, whatever. If you have a soccer field, they have a track running barefoot strides on there. tends to be something people can do. And I think this builds some awareness of how your foot behaves. I, I think that some runners, who are used to being, you know, very insulated, right. in big bulky mm-hmm. shoes and don't have good awareness, tell them to run barefoot. And all they tend to do, I call it colds, right. Um, they don't want to land on their heel very hard. So they tend to kind of prance and that's not optimal either. So, mm-hmm. uh, I think barefoot running is a great drill when done properly. And I think that, uh, if you just say, I'm going to do that and hope that fixes some people, it can help those people who are more in tune with movement, but those folks who, I think the folks who need it, just tell them that to, to run barefoot, that tends to, a lot gets lost in translation. Okay. All right. Thank you for explaining that. All right. So let's get to the part that people are probably like, okay, give me that already. What do you do? Okay. We're saying five to 10 minutes a day. We're saying, you know, how important this is. Okay. What do I do? Yeah. Okay. So let's give yourself a little self-test. What I'd like you to do is I want you to stand up and I want you to pick a foot, right? And I want you to, and and so shoot off, right? So I want you to stand on one foot and I want you to ask yourself a question. Do you feel your balance point on the outside of your foot, middle of your foot or inside of the foot? And if you feel it on the inside of the foot, do you consistently kind of wobble in, right? Mm -hmm. And let's break that down. Those of you who feel contact on the outside of your feet, okay, you likely have some stiffness in what we call the lateral column, okay, which is basically the outside bones in the midfoot or the heel. And so we said that foot needs to adapt down to the ground. And if your balance strategy is to, quote, wobble on the outside of your foot, that's reactive, not proactive, right? So um, we need to do some things to help you flatten your foot out. Okay, so if you're really stiff, let's say you're somebody with chronic ankle sprains, uh, about 70% of the people who have an ankle sprain keep spraining all the time. They develop these weird compensation patterns where they tend to stay way more inverted, which means the foot tends to roll upward uh, more than it should. So kind of like you're running on the outside of your foot? Right, way okay. outside. But even before your foot comes down the ground, they tend to be on the outside. So you might need to seek out some medical help locally from a physio to help uh, to help work on some joint mobility. But one of the things I'd like you to try, uh, if you go to the the MOBA board website, we have a video on the bottom. Wait, it's- you're gonna have to explain what MOBO is because yeah. we haven't said that yet. Yep. So MOBO is a little foot intrinsic strengthening tool that I developed to help people get to feet, um, and we'll definitely go into that in a second. But if, if, uh, on the mobo, moboboard.com website, we've got a simple little video on there. And it's basically you just take a lacrosse ball, which are, if you don't have one, they usually, you know, most running shops carry them are about three bucks. Uh, but it's a little mobilization you can do. You put the ball on the outside of your foot and then you put your hands on your hips and you don't move the ball on your feet. You actually keep the foot stationary and you actually twist your hips in and out. And for those of you who tend to have a lot of stiffness on the outside, what that's doing is it's mobilizing the bones mm-hmm. and getting the outer column of the plantar fascia to mobilize a little bit. And you do that for a minute and a half. So again, not 10 minutes, not an hour, right? A minute and a half. Then just stand up one foot again, I guarantee your foot will be much flatter on the ground, right? Because you said that foot has to adapt down to the ground. So if you've got a restriction in that outside balance strategy, first thing you have to do is flatten your foot down. If you're that person on our single leg balance test who tend to have things pretty much centered, you don't need any mobility work. Okay. Um, if you are the person who tend to have, uh, that balance on the kind of collapse the inside, that's just a sign that you really need some stability work, but that's a, it's a way to kind of just get it, find out, do I, first of all, do I have to unlock something? Mm -hmm. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, I always tell folks, if you want to open a door, first thing you have to do is unlock the door. Mm -hmm. Once the door is unlocked, you have to pull the handle, right? So you don't need to do 25 minutes of foam rolling and theragunning and all these stuff that are sold to us these days, right? You have to do enough, get your parts to move. Once you can move, then you have to go into stability, right? And so when we look at stability, um, imagine if you're just doing a toe raise, right? Like if you stand on one leg and do a calf raise, okay? Um, I'm not looking at, can you just do a calf raise? I'm looking at how do you steer your rear foot on your forefoot, right? So that twisting force we talked about before, Mm -hmm. right? Your foot needs to twist in, twist out as you walk and run, and you need to be able to control that motion very well. And so to do that, what we have to do is get outside of, doing calf raises and just taking a TheraBand, sweeping your foot back and forth, which is not a whole lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And we have to train our body like we actually move, right? When you walk and run, you have to support your entire skeleton over your foot. 
So it's important to train our foot in a what we call a closed chain environment, which means foot on the ground or body weights above it. Um, and so we have to train our foot to move properly. So I've de- you know over the years I've developed a bunch of uh, you know techniques to try and improve this. Um, some of the listeners out there probably heard the toe yoga exercise, which I've pushed for many years um, to try to help people get muscle control inside our foot to work very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I eventually decided to take a scale approach and to be read more people. So I developed a product called Mobo Board. Uh, and the whole idea behind Mobo Board is to train the muscles inside your feet. Okay. And when we do that, it all comes from how our, our foot and, and behaves and, and, and functions. So instead of just making a product and trying to figure out how to sell it, what I did was I said, okay, how does the foot have to move? What's the architecture of your foot like? What's the best environment to train that, right? I'm not going to change your body structure. I'm going to change your function and control the structure you have. So what I did was develop a, it's a, it's a rocker board, right? So it pivots in a direction and the direction it pivots is exactly in line with your sub Taylor joint, which is a joint that that you pronate and supinate around. So that the axis of the board is very critical. The second thing is, is that when you uh, look at how our foot is controlled, it needs to start with your big toe. Okay. So if you look at your hands for a second, you'll notice you have three joints in your in each finger. And when you have two joints in your thumb, mm-hmm. and if you drive a nail with a hammer, right, you wrap your fingers around the hammer and you also wrap your thumb around the hammer, right? If you wrap your thumb around the hammer, that's where most of your control comes from is opposing your thumb, mm-hmm. right? To anchor down and drive the nail. If you don't understand this, go find a nail, wrap your thumb, your fingers around it, not your thumb. You're, you have no control over the hammer. Okay. Um, fingers are designed for curling around things. Thumbs are designed for locking and opposing and stabilizing. Now, Look at your foot. You have three joints in each one of your little toes. Little toes are designed to flex and curl, right? And your big toe has two joints. It's not designed for that. It's designed to drive down, okay? So let's talk about this. It's important. Again, current state of rehab, and for most folks, unfortunately, is take a TheraBand and swing it back and forth, which works muscles in your shin, not your foot, Okay, or do your little marble pickups and your towel curls, which strengthens the gripping muscles, not the stabilizing muscles. When you do gripping type things and you're training that people have probably done a little marble pickup exercise or towel curl stuff, you're literally training your body to pick your metatarsal head up off the ground of your of your big toe, which leads to instability. That's the wrong strategy to train. You want to train a strategy which is which is biasing you or you can use the word forcing you to drive your big toe down for support. Mm. So at the MOBO board, what we did was I gave you support where you, I want you to have it and took it away where you don't. So uh, there's a platform for your big toe to sit on and there's a hole, okay, for your second, third, fourth, and fifth toes to drop into. So if you're somebody who tries to curl and grip, there's nothing there. Right. And so what we've got now is a tool which lets you do a bunch of intrinsic work. Right. So intrinsic and muscles that start and end inside your feet um, and uh, and really help you know, teach you or train your body to use the big toe properly. And so the cool thing about the board is you mentioned limited time. Right. So what if you took all your, you know, your single leg uh, deadlifts that you're doing, your little tippy bird exercises and your hip work. Right. And you said, OK, what if I just do that on a surface which kind of mm-hmm. forces me to integrate my foot? Well, that's what mobile board is, right? So I'm trying to help runners do, you know, get more bang for your buck with less time. And so uh, without having somebody with you one-on-one trying to train you, you can just basically jump on this thing. And it's going to, again, people are like, wow, I've never felt my arch get sore before, right? Like that's the whole idea. I want to get those muscles inside your feet to work, to control the twist of the foot. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you for explaining that and, and giving, you know, a few different scenarios for people and you know, you mentioned moboboard.com. I will have links in the show notes and Jay has been kind enough to give uh, 10% off to running for your listeners. If you use code TINAMUIR10, that's T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R-10 at moboboard.com. And I'm assuming you have quite a lot of videos on there for people to to go check up and, and gonna go figure out which ones they need. Um, in addition to, like you said, just using it while you're doing the things that you would be doing for your strength training. And it's interesting you mentioned that because I was going to say like, I, you know, I've moved now, so I, I'm unfortunately not working with him right now um, in person. But uh, my strength coach, Drew, used to make me do a lot of my exercises barefoot or on like a, a foam pad just for that, st- you know, that stabilizing kind of action. And um, just to kind of, you know, bring this home, wrap, wrap us up here. Is this for everyone? Like, 
Does every runner need the the MOBO board? Um, what kind of person are you speaking to specifically here? Yeah, uh, great question. I'm going to wrap up with a bunch of key points. This might be a little bit loaded, but here we go. Uh, if your sport requires you to have your foot do something, you need to improve your foot strength, period. Hardly anybody does this, right? And it's like I always tell people, you can get better at anything you apply yourself to, right? Mm-hmm. You can get better at improving your foot control and foot stability, uh, number one. Number two, what's different about this? Let's see, you, you said something very interesting Um you know, doing things barefoot, doing things on cushion pads. Um, I love training on hard surfaces. I love training barefoot on flat ground. And the reason why is because the big thing is proprioception, feel for the ground, right? If you have good awareness and feel for where you are, your body tends to work better. When you put your foot on soft, squishy surfaces, what you're doing is you're taking away proprioception, which is a sensory phenomena of position sense. And so it's a very big distinction. I want to make sure you understand the difference between making things harder and making things more specific. Okay. So a soft, squishy pad lets you just crank out the outside of your foot and do what I call balance. What happens is people wind up shifting their hips and their trunk a whole lot instead of actually working to specifically improve strength in the foot. Mm. So I'm really big. And and again, like if you look at the entire field of how we rehab people, if you have vestibular problems, inner ear issues, we love putting people on soft, squishy pads because it takes away proprioception because I want them to improve their reliance on that problem. So yeah, training things on on a soft, squishy pad is harder. It's not better, right? Um, I always tell folks, the whole reason is we do things. We're trying to put you in the best environment to get gains. And to do that, you want to have something firm. So yes, Training your foot on flat ground barefoot is wonderful. The reason why MOBO has a place is because your foot's not static, it's dynamic, it moves, and MOBO allows your foot to move uh, because I want to train some motion. And it is hard because I want to give you that purpose at the sense. So um, the idea is, it's yeah, it's, it's a great way to sort of get at what's the best way to train. And so we have things, you asked about exercises. Uh, on the website, I have things broken up into two big categories for most folks. We have what we call the the... the five for feet. Okay. So it's five exercises where I have folks start mostly and it's mostly foot intensive things. Yes. Your theory hips working a little bit too, but it's really exercises designed to get you into um, mm-hmm. getting you know, activation and kind of, you know, sinking your brain with muscles inside your feet. Okay. Try those for the most part for a while. Uh, but then guess what? Those of you doing, again, we mentioned uh, tippy birds and single leg deadlifts or split squats and, you know, kettlebell work, you can do that on the MOBO, right? So the goal is to say, Hey, look, give you some resources to go back and look at and say, how do I modify things I'm already doing? Or maybe you're not doing, um, and you want to get some double bang for your buck. You know, again, we can work your hip abduction strength next to rotation on a MOBO because guess what? That line of rotational stress mm-hmm. we talked about, you have to basically learn to steer the big toe down and steer the hip out. That's how you build control. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, Joe. That's really, really helpful. And again, you can get 10% off by going to moboboard.com and using code TINAMUA10. There will also be links in the show notes um, so you can find some of the things Jay was talking about. Um, anything else you would kind of like to wrap up with here? Just a, a final reminder for my listeners. Yeah, I would just say this. Uh, you know, Jay, I, I built Mobo to help solve some problems I've seen over the years. While I really hope you, <laughs> hope you get one, honestly, uh, I really hope you leave this with the goal of how do I train comprehensively, right? I mean, whether you buy a MOBO or not, you absolutely have to take some time to improve your foot control. Uh, that's what the message I want to leave you with. You know, you want to prepare optimally, and that's the way to do this. So yeah, check out the website. And also, if you follow us on Instagram at, uh, at mobo.board, uh, I'm posting some, you know, kind of current and relevant stuff uh, all, all the time for folks. So All right, thank you. And I just want to say to the listeners that, um, you know, if this is your first time of meeting, hearing Jay, and those of you who have heard him before probably already know this, that Jay isn't someone who, you know, thinks, how can I make money? I need to make this because people will buy it. Like Jay really, really cares and wants you, genuinely wants you to succeed and go get those goals. So I know he would not be, you know, talking so passionately about this if he didn't really believe in it. So I look forward to hearing your your thoughts um, to those of you who do go get it. Jay, thank you so much for your time and uh, for just educating us and and once again, just being this kind of leader in the industry for actually wanting to do what will help runners rather than just kind of put off problems that they've been dealing with for a long time and will continue to deal with. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. 
My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. He is awesome, right? And he gives us a lot to think about. And, you know, I, I'm quite proud of myself for being able to speak up and kind of say to him, like, look, is this just another thing we need to do? Do we just need to keep adding this to our list? Because I, for one, am not the best at doing the little things. But I really think what Jay is saying is something very important and it makes a lot of sense. And and this guy, I'm telling you, he leads the charge. In a few years' time, this will be all anyone's talking about. Jay really knows his stuff and he always heads up before everyone else. He really is kind of ahead of the curve in that way. So do not miss out the opportunity to get to know what he's been doing to check out Mobo. I will have lots of links in the show notes for you to go check that out. And also the other things that we mentioned in there. Um, I just want to remind you that um, this is the final week to enter the Compete to Create giveaway that you remember Michael Gervais from a few weeks ago. Um, He is giving one of my listeners the opportunity to win a course which is worth $500. So do not go miss that out. You can find that at tinamuir.com forward slash giveaway. His Compete to Create course is his kind of mental wellness, kind of getting to know, getting to love you course. You can get it, um, like I said, $500. There's one of you going to be winning. So this is the final week. Doors will close this Sunday, the 26th of January. Now on that note, if you do not want to just wait for the giveaway, if you want to just go ahead and get his course, remember you can use code finding mastery for $50 off if you want to go straight there. And I'm taking the course right now. So interesting. So, so, so interesting. So I just want to take another quick minute to thank our sponsors for this episode um, and give you their coupon codes. So recoup, you can use code Tina Muir for 15% off at recoupfitness.com. Body health, you can go to tinamuir.com forward slash aminos to get that perfect amino I always talk about. And you can get yourself 10% off the entire website, either going through that link or going to bodyhealth.com and using code TINAMUR10. And finally, Generation You Can, you can get 25% off your first order by going to generationyoucan.com and using code TINAMUR25. All right, my friends. So next week we are going to have Claire Gallagher back on the show. Yes, I am breaking my rule. She's coming back on only six months later. Um, But this is going to be just a really insightful episode. And I please, I beg of you, listen to this. It is so important. You know what we're going to be talking about, environmental stuff. It is, it is dire. Like we really are in trouble here. So please just go in with an open mind, come back next week and listen to that episode. You know, Claire really is doing her part to kind of help. And I know many of you want to help and you want to do what you can, but you're just not sure. So that is where Claire's going to come in. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on that episode. My friends, have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.